So if you could have two of the absolute best people that know how to systematize e-commerce and Amazon businesses in the world for a whole 40 plus minutes to ask them anything you wanted, what would you do? Well, I had the pleasure of doing that and in this video, you get to see it all. I chat with two of the founders of Escala who reveal their exact process to systematize and scale both small and massively large e-commerce businesses. If you run an e-commerce business, you wanna know how to systematize and scale it, sit back, cause this is gonna be a doozy. Alrighty guys, so welcome to another exciting interview episode of Heist. Again, we're getting into one of my favorite and lesser discussed topics, which is structuring and scaling your business using systems. I know operation sounds incredibly sexy, but I guarantee you when we get the next two gentlemen on the line here, uh, it will seem sexy because these guys are literally the absolute legends of standard operating procedures. So I've got with me uh, Eli Lipschatz, goes by Lippy, and then his partner, Yanni Kosminski, literally two legends from Australia and now live in Israel. They run two incredible businesses that are really the cornerstones to scale. One is Multiply Me, which is a staffing agency for e-commerce businesses. And the other, which is really gonna be the focus for our conversation today, is Escala, where they basically deep dive into businesses, they deconstruct them, they systematize them in a way that produces insane scale and leverage. And we're gonna get into how to do that today. So in case I butchered uh, your intro and your background, guys, why don't I give you guys the, the floor just to do a quick intro and then we'll get into the fun stuff. <laughs> you, you you did great, mate. You really, you nailed it, um, Adam. Uh, thanks for having us. We're excited to be here. And most importantly, we're excited to share a bit of value here. So Lippy, I don't know if you wanna hit share and, and jump into it, but I'll tell you guys, like Adam said, we are we live eat breathe sleep everything that is systems for e-commerce businesses so as lippy pulls this up really what we do is we've built the world's first and only specialized e-commerce process improvement management consulting practice so today we have about 30 management consultants out of largely ernst and young some count out of accenture and deloitte so we're talking about professional level management consultants really to build our own methodology and maturity analysis on how to systemize a business based on people, process, and technology. So what we're going to share with you today is really the inside scoop of what we do, how we do it, and really the objective is how you guys can take this away at home and implement it yourselves. I'll pass it over to you, Lip. Yeah, yeah. And everything that we're going to talk about today has been refined and tweaked over a couple of years now working with over 50 different Amazon operations where we really deep dive into the SOP levels. So uh, those range from seven figure operations, eight figure, nine figure, all the way up to aggregator, um, some agencies as well. So the feedback that we're giving is very tailored towards Amazon businesses. And it's not just generic how to systemize any business, but it's how to systemize an e-commerce business. So that's an important thing to sort of note before we jump into it. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point. And, and something that I really like about you guys and what you're doing is, is that, you know, systems and SOPs have been around, you know, since business management kind of came into structure, right, and early industrialization. But um, it's rare to see a focus on e-com because they're very unique, less people-centric businesses. They really are about systems, technology, and process. But there's, for whatever reason, hasn't been a ton in that space. And you take it another layer further to us that sell on the Amazon sales channel, which has its own distinct processes and work streams, you just don't see that. So I think the, the kind of deep dive know-how and the, the behind the curtains view that you guys have seen into, you know, a nine figure plus, you know, aggregators down to seven figure sellers, I think really makes this unique in addition to how you do it. So um, duly yeah. noted on that for sure. Awesome. So this is, I guess the Amazon seller hero journey. I know that everyone's different and everyone comes from a different place, but this is more or less how we see many different Amazon sellers, uh, succeed. So they sort of start off as a side hustle, um, as a, as a solopreneur, maybe they have a partner, uh, in many cases, they've still got a full-time job on the side and then they experience that initial success. So generally it's the first product that they launched or one of the first products that they've launched really takes off and they start to see this as a career opportunity beyond just a side hustle that can bring them some more disposable income. 
uh, and I know this actually happened to you, Adam. And then they quit the they quit their job, transition to full time, and really accelerate that growth. So a lot of times that's when they go for their second or third product run. They expand on the success that they had. Uh, you know, they've got the proof of concept now, and they're willing to double down. And then this is a term that I've actually heard you use, Adam, and and I really love it. It's the victim of success. So success is awesome. Uh, but then you do become a victim, whether that's from a cash perspective, uh, because you're forced to sort of continue to buy inventory and the cash cycles of Amazon are very difficult. Uh, but then you also have the sort of the victim of success when it comes to just your workload. Um, the, the more successful you are, the more there, there is to do. And you're on something that we call the Amazon treadmill, where if you hop off, you know, you can't take a three month break of, of going out of stock just so you can sort of rejuvenate. Um, and, and get motivated again, you really need to stay on that treadmill. So you have three options. Um, you can either automate, and in, in many cases, automating is the best. Uh, if there is a technology out there that's gonna allow you to automate a, you know, something that you're doing, then that's probably the best option. Uh, there are a lot of manual processes and, the, and it's just impossible to automate absolutely every component of a business. So the, the next be best option and the one that we're going to talk about today is delegate. Um, and, and, you know, that's going to require a, a, a business system. And we're going to talk about what that business system looks like. And then the worst option is you don't automate, you don't delegate, and you basically just implode. Um, and, you know, that's that actually does happen to a lot of Amazon sellers. We're seeing a lot of sellers currently uh, sell probably and leaving a lot of money on the table because they just don't have the option of staying in their business. We're seeing a lot of negative, uh, negative growth as well. So uh, today is all about delegating. And really, if we simplify what a Scala does, it's helping you graduate this stage of, I don't know what to do anymore and turn you into a proper business leader um, all the way from the side hustle as a solopreneur, all the way to you know, someone with a huge business system with people around them that they've effectively delegated to. So when we talk about delegation, there's really two forms of delegation. The one that we see with most Amazon sellers, unfortunately, is to delegate tasks. So this is, uh, especially on the multiply me side of the business, this is what we would call the, the VA mindset, where you really um, are delegating the most basic task. You're not really explaining too much of the why, it's more just the how, and this is what I want you to do. Um, and that does save time because you're not the one who actually ends up having to do the task, but it doesn't protect your focus, which is something that's super important. Um, and you're still working in the business rather than on the business. So it's, a, it's really just a short term mindset and you can get away with having a few disconnected SOPs, um, which might be a loom video. It might be something else, but, uh, that's only going to help you delegate tasks. When it comes to delegating responsibilities, you're speaking to someone and saying, I want you to be accountable for this outcome so that I myself can go and focus on something else. So in traction, they say delegate and elevate. By delegating to, to someone else, you're able to elevate. And this really requires a comprehensive business system with you know, SOPs that link together through process maps or some other kind. We want a centralized business hub. We're going to talk about ClickUp today. Um, we want everyone to have their associated KPIs. And these are the things that Escala helps you do. Um, and we're gonna sort of show you how. So before we do jump into the how, we get this question a lot, does this actually help my business? And, and what people mean is, does this help my bottom line? So we've just got a few examples of how this really does help your bottom line to have a, a systemized business. So there's sort of three questions in here. The first one is the hero product rule. We all know that we have sort of that hero product that we place all of our attention on. We're constantly optimizing that listing. We're doing the keyword research. So the question is, what if you could give the same level of attention to your top 30 products as you do to your top three products? So people might say that's impossible, but really what, you know, you're only a process and a system away from being able to do that. If you've got the correct system and you can delegate it to the right person, you know, that's, you can unlock that. They might not be able to do it exactly as well as you personally could, but if you've got the right system, they're gonna be able to get to 80, 90% as well as you. The next thing is the visionary's time. How many ideas pop into your head every single day that you know would just take your business to the moon, but you don't have the time to execute on them? So what if you could allocate 50% of your time to things that weren't urgent, that things that were only important, and you could really st step back and say, what if I can do the things that I've been thinking about in the shower or on the walk with the dog or whatever? What if I could actually execute on them? And what would the value be to your bottom line? 
And, and again, you're only a system away from being able to do that. And then product development acceleration. You know, if you've got proof of concept on your brand, on your subcategory, what's preventing you from bringing five more products to market in 2021 or 20, we're actually in 2022 now than you did the previous year. So is it cash flow because there's solutions for that or is it speed of delivery, you know, quality of delivery? Do you have the people around you who can actually do that? Because for the most part, these are systems. They're not, you know, it's not a magic wand. It's, it's really systems that can be followed. So, you know, systems that work for you. And, and when we talk about these systems, they free up key individuals. Um, they allow you to onboard new talent quickly and autonomously, which is a, a blocker for a lot of people. They mitigate the risk of, of, you know, significant reliance on, on specific people. Um, and they allow you to sort of make really quick and actionable changes to your business system because it's, documented so you have how the what the current state is so you can really quickly create a future state and say this is the small thing that we need to tweak that's going to make that's going to unlock and leverage i know you love to talk about leverage it's going to allow us to really unlock that leverage so that's a system that works for you whereas a system that you work for and i think a lot of people attempt to implement systems um so a system that you work for is sort of like that bottom-up approach where you just have countless SOPs. You don't know where to look for them. You lose them all the time. You end up recording the same loom, loom video three or four times. Um, and that generally comes because you start by documenting the most granular process and not from the top. So we'll talk about how you document from the top down rather than the bottom up. Um, no correct storage methods. So you don't know where to find these SOPs. There's no consistent format. Some of them are loom videos. Some of them are Google sheets. Um, you have no one responsible for maintaining. So really quickly, these SOPs sort of are no longer maintained and no longer relevant. And then the final thing is downloaded templates. You know, that's a good starting point, but uh, everyone needs to customize SOPs to their own specific business. So, you know, when we talk about how you should document your process, we're really talking, uh, we say how to, how to systemize your business. A system is essentially the alliance of technology, process, and people. So if you're technology process and people are aligned and they're working together. That is what we call a system. I think for a lot of Amazon sellers, um, when they think about documenting SOPs, they're thinking technology, but what we want to do is integrate people and process into that SOP documentation because that creates accountability and it creates a far more clear vision for everyone in the organization as to who's doing what. So a really basic example, but you know, when you're documenting an SOP, you've got click here to download the keyword search term report inside of Helium 10. We want to change that to every Monday, the data analyst downloads the keyword search term report by clicking here inside of Helium 10. So we want a combination of people, process, and technology. By the way, I love that. I, I don't think many people frame it that way. And uh, that's special what you just said. So yeah, that's, that's incredible. Thanks. Thanks. And, and this is really the, the secret sauce. You know, if I had to give you one slide that sums up what we do in a Scala, it's this, and I'll stop presenting now um, on, a, on a deck and I'll actually start jumping into the process maps and the, the ClickUp workflows. But essentially what we do in a Scala, I, I, I mentioned previously how many people, when they come to document SOPs, they try and just document the most granular, complicated process that they have. What we do is we take a step back and we document from the top down. So we start with we, we, in a Scala, we have a process hierarchy, which is five different levels. The first level is the core functions. And that goes all the way down to the working instructions, which is what we call the click here, click here instructions. So many people get stuck starting at level five. We actually start at level one. So level one is the core functions. So if we take research and development, for example, or let's just take any Amazon private label business, they're more or less consistent. So you have research and development or product research and development. You've got brand management, you've got inventory management, and you've got customer support. Those are pretty much the core functions of a business. And then the next level down is your processes. So let's take research and development. What are the processes that make up research and development? So you would have product research and validation, product sourcing, product development, product sign off. It's going to look slightly different for each business, but that sort of high level process map of level one and two is the crucial starting point for really documenting your business system comprehensively. So I'll jump into what this looks like before, now. Before you jump into that, I mean, this is a, a great example, but just to sort of really double down, the, the reason why we look at it in a way from the top down versus the bottom up is that 
when you have a deep understanding of all the moving parts that make up your business, and I think the one that we love to sort of draw upon is listing creation, right? When you look at how many moving pieces are inside of that from keyword research all the way through to creative design, listing optimization, you know, there are so many things, supply chain and logistics. You have to understand how each of these aspects of your business interact before you can start to really build in those click here, click here. Because I think one of the most common mistakes people make is that they'll build the SOP for the specific technology or process that they're looking to identify. And on the back of that, they'll be the only one who can find it firstly, and they won't be able to connect all of the pieces. So yeah, what Lippy's gonna show you now is really that first layer, that core functions that really starts to dictate how you layer each of these stages on and how you can build real alignment and clarity as to what's happening in your Yeah, I love that context, man. I think that's important. I think that like everything, right? We don't know exactly how to execute on stuff, so we take our best crack at it. And that oftentimes is the surface level tactical approach that's not necessarily organized or interdependent based on other activities. So how you guys start there, I think is truly unique and uh, something that we can learn from. So let's, I'm excited to look under the hood of this thing and see how it works. This is cool. Yeah, awesome. So these level one and two processes, we document them in a single process map. So this is what a typical Amazon private label business would look like. Again, every business is slightly different, but the core functions, the level ones, they're the ones that are sort of uh, the titles of the boxes. So product research and development, launch and brand management, inventory management, customer service management. That would be my first step if I was gonna go and try and systemize my business is really say, okay, how do we divide the different functions? That doesn't necessarily need to be teams because you might not have full blown out teams for each of these functions. But think to yourself, if I was gonna have a team of 50 people um, all together, how would I divide them? And I think that's a pretty good indication of what your core functions are. Now we're gonna dive, we're gonna zoom in all the way into the product listing preparation. That sort of all the way up from the core function, which is launch and brand management into product listing preparation. But uh, first to just look at this level one and two process, um, you'll see that each process has a process number. So um, 2.1 listing preparation, 2.2 product marketing strategies. The reason that we have a, that we have a numbered system is that so is so that everyone can basically speak the same language. Um, and this is going to be really important inside of ClickUp that we know that the process map talks to the ClickUp workflows and everything is numbered and so that it's very searchable. We set ourselves a KPI and, a, and our clients a KPI that everyone in the business should be able to find a specific SOP within 20 seconds, even if it's not something that they are responsible for doing. So you can go up to anyone in your team and say, hey, can you go and process a refund? They might be part of your product research and development team, but they're going to know how to find the SOP. And the reason they're going to know how to do this is because of the searchability and because you're starting from the top down. So they would go to this process map, look for where that's probably going to be, and then start to zoom in. So we're going to zoom in from this level one and two process map to the next level, which we actually also document inside of process maps. So that's going to be um, 2.1 product listing preparation. So I'll click here. And what we'll see is the next level of the process map. We actually call these tasks. And the reason we call them tasks is because these are actually our tasks inside of ClickUp. So a level three task inside of the process map is perfectly aligned with a level three task inside of ClickUp. So, so inside of the process map, what we're gonna see is that there's swim lanes. For the first time, we see who's actually doing what. And so, and so what, you know, what Lippy is really saying here is when you look at that first two layers, right, the core processes and the process groups, that's what's happening in the business across the business. And now this is as you move to that next layer, what's the individual contributors? If it's just you still today, then effectively, you know, your name is going to be attached to, to each of these delivery mechanics, but you should start to really build this out and think about sort of future proofing it. So as you look to scale and as you start to pass on those responsibilities, this is that next layer down that really starts to, to dictate, well, what's actually happening in each of the stages. And what I like about systems and process and kind of systematizing businesses for scale, honestly, is that the people can change, but the underlying functions and what you do with the business, while you might have nuanced adjustments over time, it doesn't change fundamentally. So it could be you or it could be 20 people and it's how you divide and conquer the resources, less so what you're actually doing in the system. Um, so thinking about it in this way, 
is probably why you guys can work with somebody cresting seven figures into an aggregator with 50 brands. Cause it's, um, you know, that's the cool thing about scale and leverage. It's the core thing. It's just, you're, you're adding more resources, money, et cetera, that it should scale with the system, um, which is important. Absolutely. I mean, you look at it, you know, to, to sort of sum that up, it's a no linchpins policy, right? At the end of the day, you're building this brand, this business so that it has staying power. And while people are critical to ongoing success and passing on those accountabilities and responsibilities, you don't want to be caught with your pants down. And so building an effective process and system that is, is scalable really protects you, uh, you know, from, from disaster. Awesome. So jumping into this level three process map, this is the lowest level of granularity. We're going to go with process maps, by the way, the next step is to sort of migrate into ClickUp and we migrate into ClickUp using this level three, because the process map and the tasks are perfectly aligned. I'll show what that means in a second. Uh, but we see here that we have the swim lanes. So we've got the brand manager, the listing specialist, the graphic designer, the copywriter. If you're using agencies here or freelancers, I would recommend also potentially having a swim lane for them. A, a process map should probably not have more than four swim lanes. Uh, if it does, then you might consider splitting it up into two separate process maps. What we can see here is that we start with where this process is actually triggered from. So it's triggered by the product sign off and the handover of the different core function. I know it's a different core function because this is 2.1 and that's 1.5. So it's in the ones of core functions and that's, um, that's the product research and development. So, you know, I'll just deep dive on a few of the steps, but, um, 2.1.1 conduct deep keyword analysis. And we've got a note here to say that the keyword analysis was actually already conducted, but we're going to go further because now we need to know which keywords to include in the listing. Um, and, and what's, what it's trying to show is just the general flow of how the process works. It's not saying where you should click inside of Helium 10 to do the keyword research, but what it is saying is, you know, by looking at the, at this, at a glance, I understand who does what. You can see that we have on page connectors. So we've got this A and then A here. And the reason that we do that is so that we don't have arrows sort of going everywhere. But essentially what this, what happens with this process and you can sort of pause and zoom in and really read this process. The purpose isn't to show you what the best keyword uh, product listing creation process is. It's more just to show you how we work. But in this process, the listing specialist conducts the deep keyword analysis briefs in the graphic graphic designer, briefs in the copywriter, then gets the outputs back, elevates it to the brand manager, the brand manager reviews. If there's revisions needed, it goes back to the listing specialist. If not, then it sort of proceeds to the next round. The listing specialist creates the Amazon listing, gets it signed off by the brand manager, and then moves forward. Now you might be the brand manager, but and this is actually what we see specifically for listing creation is that when we start working with someone, we see that the sort of the founder or the leaders, the leadership team member is involved in most of the processes. And by the time we're finished working with that client, they really only have one or two boxes and it's more just like review and approve. So when we speak about protecting your focus and protecting your time, it's, it's this, it's about saying we're, ac we're not just delegating the task. We're actually delegating the responsibility to the listing specialist. Who's going to work with the copywriter, work with the graphic designer. And I'm just going to come at the end and make a decision as an executive, as a leadership team member, what I want to be doing is making decisions. So now I'm going to scoot over to ClickUp. And what we're going to see is that these are actually consistent inside of ClickUp. So inside of ClickUp, we have the wiki, which is basically a Think of Wikipedia, it's a company wiki. It's where you can find how to do anything inside of your business. And then we have the workflows, which is what we use on a day-to-day -day basis. And the workflows are basically templates that follow the same chronology as the uh, process map. So we see here 2.1.1, conduct deep keyword analysis. 2.1.2, .2, send write-up request to the copywriter. That's exactly the same as the process map. You can sort of go back and forth and see. And these, what they have is subtasks as well. So I'll expand all of the subtasks. Let me just move this to the side a little so that it's a little bigger. And is this within a space in ClickUp, Lippy? Yep. Yeah. So we recommend having one space per core function. And what we're going to do is we're going to have one folder for each new product. It basically shows the entire critical path from product research and development all the way through to your launch and 
Once it gets to 90 days, we then move it into the brand management core function space. However, this is going to be different for each, uh, for each Amazon seller. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't templatize it and say that this is a blanket solution for everyone. No, I like the way you think about it. We, we structure ours as each brand has its own space and then there's subfolders by function, but this is an interesting way to do it. Um, uh, I just like how other people kind of splice the onion, so to speak, but this is cool to see how you guys are structured. Yeah, this. yeah. We we actually conducted, just as a side note, an internal debate inside of a Scala as an upskilling session. So what's what's the best way to do uh, click up for Amazon private label sellers? So that's a whole nother discussion. I, you know, this was the one we came up with. That's a fun, that's a fun Friday night <laughs> discussing folder structures and right, click up. And right. you know that you're an SOP <laughs> nerd when that's probably like a, 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 a pretty exciting meeting in the Scala uh, office, right? <laughs> if you only uh, knew no seriously this is cool how you guys have done this so these this is basically a template that every time i need to trigger this function i'm just going to duplicate the template which is a really simple thing to do inside of ClickUp, and then i can actually set it up so that it's auto assigned if i want to go really deep which which we do when we work with you we can auto create sort of the um, the date dependencies. So we know that task A should come five days after, after task B. And then all we need to do is sort of assign the first date and the rest is auto assigned. So we can go really deep with this. What I'm showing you is pretty basic, but what we're going to show is that basically each of these tasks, I can click on them. So for example, 2.1.2, send write up request to the copywriter for the Amazon listing. I can click on that but what it's going to link me to is the wiki. So if I come to do this task, I don't need to check the SOP every time I do it. If I'm doing this three times a month, I might not need to check the SOP every single time because I'm probably going to remember how to do it. But it, just in case, the SOP is going to be here and it's going to link me directly to the wiki, which is kind of a separate thing, but it's interlinked. It follows the same hierarchy as the process maps descending into the workflow. So everything sort of speaks the same language. So inside of the wiki, we're going to have, you know, an about the company. We might have the team structure. And is this Notion or is this actually in ClickUp as yeah, well? Yeah, this is actually in ClickUp. It's, it's called ClickUp Docs. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And that's why we love cool. ClickUp more than any other project management tool, because we can interlink the docs with the uh, with the workflows. So some of the other competing cool. project management tools don't have the, those capabilities yet. Um, yep. So inside of the standard operating procedures, I mean, the wiki is going to have much more than just the SOPs. We're going to have an about the company. We're going to use this as well for onboardings. So onboardings become more or less a sort of a hands-off process where you just meet the person once a day um, at the end of the day and say, I want you to go through this part of the wiki and ask me questions at the end of the day. As you can see here, the wiki follows the exact same structure. So we have a wiki page for each of our core functions. We're going to go into launch and brand management. The process map is actually embedded inside of here. So it's taking a second to load here. I'm not sure exactly why, but we're going to be able to see the full process map here. We're going to be able to zoom in as well. Let's just say we want to go into 2.1 product list and creation. I can navigate it in a couple of ways. Uh, here we have all of the different, and I'll just jump back into the process map for a second so that you can see 2.1.1 conduct deep keyword analysis. Let's just take 2.1.7 review write-ups. That's going to be exactly the same as this. So it's super consistent and we always know where to look for things. Now it's sort of worth noting. I didn't note it before. You might've had this question is why some boxes orange and some boxes blue. A blue box is going to be something that's a linear step-by-step -step process and an orange box is going to be a decision. So we document decisions differently to the way we document linear process, where linear process is, is really like, how do we document step by step? The decision, what we're trying to document is what are the different things that we need to review? What information do we need in order to make this decision? So I'll show you, I'll show you sort of two different types of documentations. And again, the point here isn't to show you a really, uh, a tactically correct keyword, uh, you know, product listing creation process. It's more just to show you the flow. Let's just take 2.1.2, send write up request to the copywriter for Amazon listings. So this is the way that we document SOPs. We've got purpose. What's the purpose of this SOP? What's the frequency? Who's it performed by? For specific uh, processes, we're actually going to have who's the backup manager. Um, if it's like a time critical process, uh, what input do we require in order to actually kick off this process? And then we have the step-by-step -step instructions. So everyone likes to document the step-by-step -step instructions differently. Some people like screenshots and more text. Some people like checklists, some people like uh, Loom videos. And that's really a matter of preference. Personally, I prefer Loom videos that are sort of broken up into two or three minute bits. We have clients that prefer really well-documented SOPs. And, and I think 
you know, Amazon is so flexible and so adaptive. Every three to six months, you're really going to be needing to update these. So that's what you should think about when it comes to what's your preference. So here we're going to have sort of the step by step. This is a very basic SOP, but just so you get a feel for sort of what each SOP looks like, we try to break it down so that it's very digestible and that you're going to easily know where to look, what you're looking for. A decision is slightly different. This, for example, is review the write-ups. So are we going to approve the, the, the write-ups, enhanced brand content, photos, and videos? So what's the purpose of making this decision? How frequently do we make this decision? Who are the accountability? So it's not just who is this performed by, but you know, who do we need to consult for this decision? Who's the final approver? The research and reports. So basically what research and data do we need to be able to make this decision? And then the decision criteria. So what are, I guess you could call these tenets, Amazon people would call them tenets, but what are the different sort of concepts that we need to consider when making this decision? So again, we've documented this in a very basic way, but you can take the template and take it to the nth degree as to what support can you give this decision maker so that they can make the best decision possible. Just just to say, and I think it's probably becoming clear to, to anyone who's taking the time to watch this, that the slide that Lippy shared at the very start, the difference between delegating tasks versus delegating responsibility, when you take it to this level where people understand what the decision-making criteria is, who's accountable and responsible, what needs to be delivered, it changes effectively the mindset and the logic that I can now set it and forget it and have someone accountable and responsible for this delivery mechanic, as opposed to just starting from that, building out of the tasks, starting from that bottom up and delivery, which is, you know, the, the typical, uh, well, you know, I'll call it, it's, it's not necessarily a mistake. It's just typically the starting point or the entry point to starting to move into documentation of process and how you start to graduate in how you can leverage your time better. Yeah, and I think what's interesting, and I think a, a natural fear is you kind of get into that victim of success kind of stage and kind of death by a thousand paper cuts is you kind of have this hero complex like, well, no one could do keyword research like me or no one can do a creative brief. And so like, I need to be involved in there because it's not when it gets to the decision stage, it's not going to be baked enough for me to actually uh, be comfortable with it. But when you do this stuff and you go through the process and you get people integrated and you take out some of the guesswork and nuance, not to say that there's zero of that, but that's where the decision can help. Well, did you? Why did you not add this word? Or why for this third image? I prefer this point versus this one. Like that's easy to happen. And you could have done that in your own head if you executed the process yourself. But I think that you would be, if you're scared of that piece, I would just say to people that you would be shocked at how far along stuff can be when you move into decision mode versus the actual execution tactical mode. So uh, the way that you guys have structured that lends itself for that to happen. Um, and that decision point, I think is one of the unique things that I haven't seen before certainly in an Amazon context, but I think that's super critical. And I think that that maybe gets people comfortable with, okay, why well, there, there still is a, a check and balance here where the business isn't going to get off the rails for things that matter, but I'm not involved in the stuff that doesn't matter. Right. So, so I love how you guys have structured that. So that's, that's really cool. And, and to, to sort of answer the question that I guess you proposed, no one can do this as well as I can. So how can I delegate it? We use a, a framework called the the law of delegation, which basically says if someone can do something 80% as well as I can do it, at that point, it's worth delegating. So that's sort of an interesting question because in order to get to that 80%, you will get to that 80% if you document the process. So no one will be able to get to that 80% if you haven't documented the process, unless you find a superstar. But um, by documenting this process, and I think that's why, uh, process documentation enables delegation is that by documenting the process, you enable people to get closer to what you would be able to achieve if you were the individual contributor. And by doing that, you enable proper delegation, and then you're able to elevate yourself into sort of bigger and better things. I think um, just as a general rule, an Amazon seller who you know is, is looking to push into at least eight figures, I think maybe seven figures, you can get away with it. But the eight figure sellers that we work with they they don't spend a lot of time working in the business they they really start to spend most of their time working on the business thinking strategically what are my next products what's my next category you know what's my next marketplace so um in order to sort of get yourself in, into that space i think you really need to start thinking about delegation and that's not you know it's not for everyone some people would prefer i guess sell before they get to that point and that's totally okay 
Uh, but anyone who's looking to really break into that space, and, and it's not just eight figures. I think, you know, once you start to hit more than one or two million, you really start to feel that crunch that you need people around you who can help you with the workload. That's that's sort of the, the framework or the mental model that I would use to understand what should I be delegating. Yeah. And I think one thing I would say too is, is, is I, you know, I think like most Amazon sellers as you're, as you're growing and scaling, you have your day job or whatever it is that you're doing. And then this is something that you got to kind of crank out a couple hours every night or whatever your, your workflow is. Even if you're that one person solo operator, that's humming at 600 grand a year. And you're, you're wanting to crest into a million, two million where you can really start to either evaluate an exit or evaluate leaving your day job. Amazon's not complicated. But I think you could say that it's complex in the sense that there's a lot of little things that you got to do and not any one of them is hard or difficult or going to you know kill too many brain cells. But when you're working a job or even if you're t- totally dedicated to a brand, there's just things in life that happen that make it difficult for those 20 things that need to happen this week get done. And I think by building systems and processes, it makes it digestible, number one, but it makes it such that you can actually sequence it such that you're only dedicating the mental energy to that thing when it's actually needed, even if you ha- even if you aren't ready to hire people yet. So I think it's, it's good to do before that. And then if you want to hire somebody, it makes it hiring very easy because then you've got it all kind of incrementalized in the business. So I think, uh, again, uh, uh, you're preaching in the choir here because I've become such a systems guy, but I think how you guys have done it and thinking about the value of how do you actually institutionalize it uh, – is powerful. And and you want to talk about like the thing or a handful of things that could change the trajectory of your business. Yeah. There's product development, there's entering new markets, all this stuff, this stuff, which a lot of people don't think about, uh, or really put time into could be the linchpin that really accelerates the business. So, uh, amazing how you guys have thought about it. I really love it. So, yeah. And I, I mean, a lot of the time when we speak to people, they say that they're too busy too busy to build systems and process. And I think that's a, that's sort of a cycle that a lot of people are, are in and and it's totally legitimate. Um, but it's like, I don't have time to save time. So that's, I guess the reason that we created a Scala is to be that circuit breaker and help people document those systems, help them sort of regain control of their business and professionalize the way that they run it. Um, and then, and then they'll be able to sort of because we were that circuit breaker, they'll be able to sort of maintain it and run it in a systems oriented way moving forward. Um, so I think that's, that's really our mission and that's what we've been able to do for, uh, dozens and dozens of sellers. So um, maybe one question to kind of cap it. I'm just kind of curious for you guys. You guys have, have worked with kind of all sizes and flavors of, of e-commerce businesses. If you kind of distill it to first principles kind of thinking, what are some of the biggest move? Like, let's say that I can't afford a skull yet and I want to build out my own stuff. And like the biggest bang for the buck items that you guys see in terms of like layers of tackling this thing, what would that be? Um, and it could be from, from smaller sellers up to like your nine figure aggregator clients that have much more complex businesses, but like the big bang are things that you, you're like, Hey, if you're going to do three things, do these three things first, and then you can kind of get down the, down the chain further. Well, I'd say, I'd say before Lippy gives you the details in that, the, the great equalizer is the fact that all of us have 168 hours a week. There's no more time. You can't buy more time. It's, you know, it's inevitable. So the, the mindset and the logic that you need to frame in is how can I find tasks that I know, like Lippy said before, 80% can be done 80% of the way there. What are the easy tasks that can already be built out that I can then move? Because again, to, to, to come back to what you said earlier, the death by a thousand cuts, that's the whole problem with the Amazon business, right? Is that like, well, I could just do that keyword research or I could just manage my PPC or, you know, there's no reason why I couldn't just make that little bit of an edit on my main image because I know that it's going to rank better. But as all these things add up, you only have, you know, 168 hours in a week. So I think from a, from a mental positioning perspective, that's probably the starting point, but in terms of the bangers lippy, what do you got? Yeah, I think if I'm thinking, uh, first principles, um, customer support is the one that just needs to be delegated really quickly because it's, uh, probably 90% of your cases are going to fall under the same type of problem. So even though it, it might seem like a really small workload, which it probably is, it's always an urgent thing. And it always just takes away your focus from being able to do deep work. And it's extremely easy to, to delegate most of the time. So uh, customer support, the next one would be PPC. 
not all of PPC can be delegated. Maybe the campaign setup can't be. Most most of the campaign management can be things like removing negative keywords. They're very manual, repetitive processes that you can create clear guardrails and say, here's the, you know, here's what I want you to look for. And anything that doesn't have this amount of clicks or anything, you know, you can create rules and, and there's software for that. Um, but sometimes you are doing it manually. So either automate or delegate that pretty quickly. And then the other one I would say is just everything to do with, I guess, maintenance, um, keyword, sort of optimize it, looking at your listings, looking at the new keywords that are out there. There's such great technology that exists. Um, what is sort of lacking is the time to be able to do it. And it's in a lot of, in a lot of ways, a thankless task because you have to do the, the research, but then sometimes nothing sort of nothing pops up when you do do the research or sometimes you make a change and you don't really stick around long enough because your focus drifts elsewhere to, to analyze that change that you've made. So I would say once you've sort of created those listings, having a listings manager or a brand manager that's checking in every day, understanding where you're indexed, where you're ranking on specific keywords and, and building a report, you could create a really clear template that you want to see once a week and then just delegate that so that you don't need to log in every day and start looking at your sales and start looking at your keyword rankings and start looking at you know your sessions and things like that. You can really just have someone building a report for you and there's technology for that, but again, technology is only one third of a system. Um, you also need to have the people in the process. So those are probably the three things that I would start with. Each business is different. Each founder has a different thing that they love doing. So the, you know try not to delegate the, the thing that you love doing. Um, but, but I guess you asked me for three, so there's my, there's my three. Do you love it? Yeah. I mean, for me guys, the core points on this, this call that I thought were just fantastic. Number one, like the structure of how you think about the layers of a process. So starting with at the function level, understanding those higher level moving parts and how they are interconnected, building out systems down from that. I thought that was super critical and cool. I love mental frameworks because it can, you can always in a complex business life, you can always kind of reference back to them and that like, what can you get to 80% good enough? Like that is so, so critical. Uh, like the secret sauce to being a killer entrepreneur is doing a lot of things 70% well, I say. So maybe I'll bump it up to 80% now, but like if you do a lot of things 70, 80% well, it's going to be better than the person that could do three things to 99%, like undoubtedly. So I love that. Um, but just in general, how you guys structure, think about this, this is world-class stuff. You don't hear people speaking about it, which is why I wanted to bring you guys on. And not only that, you guys are just cool dudes. <laughs> and I, I think that there's, it's nice to find your people in the space and you guys are definitely that, um, in terms of how do, how do, how do folks work with you? If you're like, Hey, this, this, you know, this sounds like my language. I don't really necessarily want to go build it out myself. What does an engagement look like with you guys? Maybe just walk through the process. If there's people that are interested in, uh, reaching out and working with the skull. Sure. I'll say as well, Adam, I mean, you know, right back at you. It's rare that you get to find, you know, people that you really jive and connect with on, on a really deep level. And I think, you know, aside from building processes and systems, your philosophy and your channel and what you are looking to effectively help create for other people is, is really selfless and is, uh, is a beautiful thing. So Appreciate we're really, that, yeah. we're glad to be here. And, you know, if there's any way that we can help you, anyone on this channel, you know, we're, we're always there to, to do it in terms of, in terms of an engagement with us, um, typically we get on, well, let's, it's not the discovery call, but we'll get on an initial call just to get a feel for the business where you're at. You know, we have lots of different solutions and, you know, we're trying to help first. So if you're not quite ready for us, then there's areas that we might want to point you into. Maybe it's just hiring someone, uh, that can take a few things off your plate as opposed to a full blown engagement. Uh, when it comes to actually engaging us, you'll get on a discovery call with none other than Lippy right here, and he will be a therapist to your business. So he will talk <laughs> to you. You know, that's how I, that's how I sell it in. Right. Um, <laughs> Love it. He, he, you will tell him all of your worldly problems as they relate to your business. I don't know how much help he's going to be on your personal life, but uh, he's probably got some tricks up his sleeve and what he'll do is he'll build together, uh, uh, effectively a scope what that looks like you know our engagements run from at the really low end for really small businesses you're looking at about three months but typically you know you're looking on average anywhere from sort of five four to five to six months and you know in some cases with some of the larger aggregators you know they'll they'll have us build an entire team out for them and have a 12 to 18 to 24 month engagement so it's a it's a case-by-case -case basis and again our objective is always how do we help you guys first at the level that you're at. And I know one of the things that we're working on is actually building out 
of course, to help people effectively do this themselves when that's out of reach or they want to learn and they want to take it, uh, you know, a lot slower. Love it. So we'll, we'll drop the info down below if you're interested in engaging with this Scala. If you guys are cool too, if uh, maybe we can coordinate and get a link, <clears throat> if somebody wants access to this deck, would you guys be cool with that? Um, yeah, absolutely. And then you can kind of get you can get on the Escala uh, email list such that when the course drops and there's other relevant information, these guys just put out nothing but value, regardless of whether you work for, with them or not. Uh, so we'll put that down in the links below so people can connect with you. And then Yanni, I know that you've got an absolute killer podcast slash. I watch it on YouTube. I'm not like I, I'm like a weird guy where I do most of my stuff like visual on YouTube. So it's on YouTube as well. But uh, definitely a podcast called Success Scales or Successful Scales. Successful Scales. Successful yeah, Scales. Yeah. And fortunate I, enough to have you as a guest. Yeah, so check out check out my episode on that. But I literally, uh, it's awesome like background when I'm kind of doing my work having, because you have just really cool deep level intellectual conversations with aggregators to service providers to eight, nine figure entrepreneurs. Like it's it's world-class conversation, world-class uh, folks that are on there. So we'll drop a link down below to that as well. And then uh, we didn't get into it a lot, but uh, you kind of mentioned the Multiply Me that you guys actually have a kind of... Uh, business that helps people scale the people side, uh, which is the other part of this equation. So I suspect we will have you guys on again to discuss how to hire scale teams, because uh, that's a really good companion piece to process. Uh, but until that convo, guys, um, you guys were very, very kind with your time. And this is, again, deep level stuff that you don't see discussed and certainly don't see shared publicly like this elsewhere. So thanks for creating value for the community. And uh, it was great having you guys on. Thanks for having thanks us. Thanks for having that's us. awesome. Cheers. All right, guys. Well, I hope you found that as freaking awesome as I did. I absolutely love this stuff. And it's very rare to look behind the curtain and see the level of detail that was exposed in this video. So kudos to the boys at Escala. Thank you so much for stopping by. If you want to find out more about Escala, you want access to the actual deck that was covered in this conversation, click the links down below and be sure to check out Successful Skills Podcast also down below. Until next time, cheers, guys.